uh, we're going to go over the homework that you worked on this week, uh, show you how to do it. Um, because, you know, I mean, like a lot of the stuff I've given you to do this semester, I've given you a little bit of information and then tried to see if you can figure out what to do with that information. Uh, and, and then we fill in the gaps after you've tried, okay? So that's what's going to happen today. We're going to see if we can figure out, uh, you know, what to do with this project, all right? So I'm going to basically go through it with you now and, and demonstrate it. What, I, what you should do is make any corrections to your file that you need to. Um, again, do, make, make those corrections in a different color or something so I can see the difference between what you were able to figure out all by yourself and what you needed help with. Um, and then you can turn it in on Canvas, okay? Uh, so let's pull up my screen here. There we go. All right. So uh, here was the question I asked you. Calculate the acoustical gain with a 6 dB safety factor for the sound system in Stevens Center, assuming the center cluster and microphone are omnidirectional. Calculate your answer for the talker standing at the plaster line with the microphone mounted six inches from the mouth and the listener in the back row. All right, so it sounds like we need to go to our CAD file. So here is the Stevens Center CAD file that I gave you. So there's a few little bits of information that I said you're gonna need. One is I said listener in the back row. So let's, and I probably should have said back row orchestra level, but hopefully you, that's what you thought I meant. So I'll put that little ear four feet up from the, from the floor. So there's our listener. And then we need our talker. And I said our talker is at the plaster line. And this is the plaster line right there. So we're going to put our talker up. The talkers are usually about five feet up in the air. OK. And uh, now I'm going to just take this and I'm going to copy it six inches that way. And that's my microphone. Uh, so now what I want to do is I'm just going to draw some lines. OK, so I'll do a line there. That's the line from the microphone to the talker. And I'm going to do a line from the talker to the listener. And let's see, I need a line from the center cluster to the listener. And I need a line from the center cluster to the microphone. OK, so all right, I'm, I'm sort of set up here. So now uh, let's take a look at our um, formula. Remember, this is the formula that I gave you. So we're going to do 20 times the log of, in parentheses, d1 divided by ds times d0 divided by d2. And then we're going to subtract 6 from that answer. So let's uh, start plugging in values for this. Um, let me uh, let's see if I can, oops, not that. But there we go. I'm just going to move this so I can see the formula and remember how that works. OK, so uh, ds is what? The distance from the talker to the microphone, right? And I already know that is 0.5. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to just start putting these in here. So ds equals 0 0.5, OK? And then, let's see, according to my other thing, I, I also need a D1, and D1 is loudspeaker to microphone. So let's measure that. So loudspeaker to microphone, 32 feet, 2 and 3 sixteenths inches. I'm just going to call that 33 feet. OK, so that's D1. D1 equals 33 feet. OK, now I need D2. 
zero. D zero is the distance from the talker to the listener. Let's see what that is. So there's my talker, and there's my listener. I get 86, 84 feet 6 inches, so I'm going to call that 84.5. 84 feet 6 84.5, and this was D0, that's right. D0 equals 84.5. So now I just need D2, and D2 is the loudspeaker to the listener. So, loudspeaker to listener. 76 point feet 7 inches. Okay, I'm going to call that 76.5. Okay. So now we just need to uh, put this in our little formula. Sorry, my dock keeps popping over to my other screen here. All right. Stop it. Okay, so I'm going to type this out here. 20 times the log of D1 divided by DS. So D1 is 33 divided by DS, which is 0.5. Times D0, which is 84.5, divided by D2, which is 76.5. Okay. So let's start doing some of that math. Here's my little calculator. I'm going to do that 84.5 divided by 76.5, and I get 1.5. 104 or something. So I'll pop that into my memory. And now I'm going to do the 33 divided by 0.5. So 33 divided by 0.5. I get 66. So now I'm just going to multiply this by that number I have in my memory. I get 72.9. And I will get a base 10 log of that and times that by 20. My gain is 37.25. Now that is the point at which it feeds back. So I'm going to subtract my 6 from that. And I'm dealing with 31 dB of gain in this scenario. So Did Jason, I just used very slightly different measurements and so got with the safety factor like 30 dB. Yeah. You're usually like that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah so that's what happened to me. Yeah. If you're within 3 dB, you're probably oh. you're fine. Right? <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's the answer I got. 30, let me copy that, and I'll put that in here. Oh, <laughs> that didn't work. Minus 6. So it was about 31 dB-ish, OK? So now the question is, uh, same situation. What would be the gain if I used a DMVQ10 loudspeaker in the center cluster position? Uh, well, before we answer that, let's think about why that would matter. What, what sort of difference do we imagine adding a Q10 loudspeaker? What, what difference would that have on our result? Any ideas? Directionality. Yeah. They're very tight, like vertically. Mm -hmm. Potentially, yeah. So at the moment, we're assuming that our center cluster is omnidirectional. Uh, and a DMPQ10 is not entirely omnidirectional. Uh, and why do I say not entirely? <laughs> because uh, low about 250. Yeah. yeah. Everything's omnidirectional at some point. Exactly. So yeah, of course, the answer is it depends. Because it, you know, it depends on what frequency. Now, did I tell you a frequency? You did not. You did not specifically. Did I not. did not. So, uh, I, think I, I think I just did mean. I think I assumed <laughs> and did 500 hertz. Oh, I did like 1K. <laughs> so, uh, let's take a look at. I've got the manual for the Q10 here. Let's pull it up and see what information we could glean from this thing. 
So first thing is, look at this. We've got two different sets of isobars. Nice um, so which one do we use? Um, um, vertical. Well, um, so ah. it's about the horn rotation. And if you look at the picture, what's happening is they're not technically rotating the horn. They're rotating the box around the horn. <laughs> OK. Uh, but I would, if, if I was designing this system, this top one is the one I would use because I can get the tight vertical coverage, you know, all, you know, pretty far down, and then I can stay pretty wide on the horizontal, which is, you know, more like the shape of my room. So uh, that's probably, yeah, what I would want to do. All right, so looking at the vertical isobar of this thing then, what frequency do we think we ought to care about here? Um, I think that out of all of them, probably 4K, looking at 4K probably be the best option. Um, either 1, 2, or 4K, just off of the idea that you can hear it and it has well, and that would, that's almost the narrowest point, too, so we know that. So, it yeah, it depends on what kind of answer you want, right? So if you want an answer that gives you a really big number uh, and a false sense of security, then, uh, then yeah, pick some of those higher frequencies, because those are going to give you more gain. But in real life, uh, you're going to have um, all the frequencies, right? coming out of that, pick, being picked up by that microphone and coming out of the loudspeaker. So you might be able to get 60 dB of gain at 4 kilohertz, but you're never going to hear that because 125 hertz is going to feed back long before that. Uh, now, we could assume for you know, purposes of trying to get an accurate answer that we're going to use high-pass filter on the mic which I, was something I mentioned in class, uh, that you know, if this is a vocalist, there's not a whole lot of vocalists that have much happening in their voice below 150 hertz. That's pretty low frequency. Uh, there might be a few people, but not very many. So you know, we, could, we could sort of say that maybe we don't have to worry so much about this, this area where it is effectively omnidirectional because maybe we're going to filter that stuff out because we don't need it for a vocalist. Uh, so, which, which means it's sort of like this area, this 250 to 500 area that's going to feed back first, right? Because it's the most omnidirectional. So let's figure out what angle we're dealing with. And then let's look in this 200 to 500 range. And we'll get the answer that is sort of the worst case scenario. Right? And that's kind of what you're looking for with acoustical gain is you don't want to know the best case scenario. The best case scenario is the thing you don't have to worry about. Uh, you want to worry about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is the frequency that's going to feed back first. And it's going to be these lower ones. So let's go to our CAD file and see what sort of angle we're dealing with here. So the angle in question here is the angle between the axis of the microphone and the angle where the loudspeaker intersects with that. So let's see if we can snag that. So it would be here and here. That's 110 degrees. All right. That's the, um, isn't that the number that the Q tends like horizontal? Yeah, so one, one, a, one, axis, one, one axis of the horn is, is 110 degrees, yeah. But you know, again, 110 degrees at what axis, you know, or you know, what yeah, you frequency? Yeah, really. Or when whatever. is it 110? So who who really knows? But we're actually looking at the 40, right? Because we're assuming we're going to keep this narrow. Okay, so 110 degrees. We're going to be, you know, there's minus 90. Now, so 110 degrees would mean how many degrees on either side? Well. That's for the coverage of the last week. Actually, we are going the full 110 off axis, though, aren't we? So we don't have to split it. So 110 is going to be off our little chart here. Um, so I'm going to guess 
that we're actually going to be in the 12 dB range there by the time we get uh, to 110. Just given if I were to, um, oh, I'm going to try, let me try this. I think I got my pen working. So uh, let me see if I can predict where these lines are, are likely to go. Maybe like that, and maybe like that. And then, you know, 100 would be about there, which means 110 would be about there. So right in that range that I'm looking at, I'm about to hit, based on my guess, I'm about to hit that 12 dB down point. So uh, maybe I won't be entirely there, and these lower frequencies are still in the 6 dB. So uh, I'm going to guess somewhere between 6 to 12 dB of extra gain. Again, for purposes of, of feedback, I want to be as paranoid as possible. <laughs> so uh, let's just say the 6. OK? Hey, so yeah. Aren't you not quite there, though? Because the speaker isn't shooting straight off, no? What do you mean? Like being 110 off of the center of the loudspeaker would assume that the speaker is pointing straight off and towards the balcony, which it's not, no? Well, that's true. That's a good point. Um, so, you know, maybe we ought to really be measuring this angle, right? The angle that I did, that 110 is actually probably better for the microphone. So I, let's see. I, I, I calculated like the, the yeah. 40 tone for it hitting the front of the audience and then how many degrees it was from the front of the audience. Yeah, no, I think, so that, that's actually a good point. Um, I, I do think the, the better angle to measure here would be this one, right? From the on axis to that off axis line that intersects with the mic, and that's 91 degrees. So if we go back here, and you know, we're definitely, so at that point, we're still really well in the 6 dB range. Yeah, and that angle that I measured before, that would probably be the one we'll use for the microphone. That's probably more appropriate to use for the microphone. So, uh, so let's, let's say six. So I'm going to say that that's 6 dB that I get to add to my gain. So if I was at 31 dB before, I can add 6 dB of my gain because I've now used a directional loudspeaker. So now I'm at 37 dB of potential acoustical gain. So, OK, so great. I'm now up to 37. And now I'm saying, OK, what if you go to a different microphone? Well, I've got the spec sheet here for an SM58 microphone, which is the one I said to look at. This is actually for all the SM series. So let's go find the SM58. And you know, Lance asked a question last night on the discussion board about, hey, what's the deal with polar plots for microphones? And I said, well, they're the same thing. They just are upside down. Uh, so here is a polar plot for, or a pair of polar plots for an SM58 microphone. Uh, one, one slight difference with the microphone is there's not like a, there's no direct, directivity horn on a microphone. So uh, that you don't need like multiple plots for every axis. You can assume that, you know, this, co that this coverage is all, you know, all the way around. Okay. So the one thing you notice is that the zero is pointed down here. That's really the only difference. Uh, but the zero is where you point the mic. Okay. And of course, you can see hey, so that. I don't know if you switched your screen to another um, thing, but all we see is the PDF still. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> just want to you, make see, sure. you see a polar plot, right? No, it's just the PDF of the questions. I oh. Well, let's I, I see. see the polar plot. I see oh, the polar plot, yeah. Cool. It's You're just lagging behind, our, Eleanor. Uh, no, I was looking like, at my own PDF on the other screen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. So here it is. Uh, so, of course, you can see that each frequency has a slightly different coverage. No surprise. Uh, so let's figure out. Now, we already measured that angle. It's 110 degrees. It's probably the one we want to use for the microphone. So if the microphone's pointed here, that means the loudspeaker is showing up over here. Uh, let me try my pen here and see if I can. 
right? That's where my loudspeaker is going to be. Now, you know, worst case scenario here is the 125 hertz. But I think I might not have to worry about that frequency as much because I'm going to filter it, OK? Uh, so I'm going to look at this 500, which is a pretty big leap, right? But I'd really love to see a 250 in there, but they didn't give me that. So I'm going to guess I'm somewhere in between here. So we are 5 dB per division on this polar plot. You see that, where it says minus 5, minus 10, minus 15, minus 20. So it's likely that we're going to end up somewhere in here. That's the, the range. Now, if it's 5 dB per division, I'm going to say that's 6, maybe 7 dB that we're, that we're losing there. What do you think? Any, 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 any votes? 6 or 7? I would say 7 on 500, but 6 for 2. Yeah, 7. I went with 7. <laughs> I, yeah. Yeah, I went with seven. All right. I said between five and six, but I'm conservative, I guess. OK. So 37 dB is where I am starting at now. And I'm going to now get to add at least six more dB into this. OK? Maybe seven if you want to you know, be really generous with yourself. Uh, doesn't really matter. But uh, six or seven is, is fine. Either is, either is fine. You're guessing on this polar plot anyway. It's, it's, an, it's an estimate. So let's say six. Uh, so now I am where? 43 dB of gain, is that right? So I'm not too shabby. So now the question I asked was, all right, what if I switched my mic out to a sure beta 58? Do you know what the difference is between an SM58 and a beta 58? Does anybody know off the top the of the head? Beta is a polar pattern, right? It's, yeah, it's a different polar pattern. So the beta 58 is, uh, well, here it is. It is a supercardioid uh, microphone, which is just a different polar pattern. The SM58 is a cardioid. Cardioid refers to this heart shape, right? And supercardioid is something more like this. So uh, it's, it's a little bit more directional on, on, the, on that 90 degree axis. But in order to get that, it creates this lobe in the back where it starts being a bit more sensitive. So if you're not careful, that can bite you. But what you really want to do with this kind of mic is if you can position your loudspeaker, whether it's your center cluster or your monitor or whatever, so that it's lining up here with this, with this null, you know, if, you're, if it's hitting there. Ooh, you're in really great shape because it's really not very sensitive there at all. It hardly picks up anything at all frequencies, right? So pretty much all frequencies really are not being picked up at that angle. So that would be super awesome if we could make that work. Uh, what was our angle? 110. So we're almost there. We're almost at that point. So here is where 110 would kind of sort of hit, right? Uh, so we are certainly at least a 10 dB difference here. But it could be that if we, you know, if we tweak the mic stand and tip the mic a little bit, we could get this null to really line up with that center cluster. Um, and then we'd get all kinds of gain if we could convince the talker to not touch the mic. Um, but let's say that maybe that's not possible, but we can, we can safely say 10, maybe even 11 dB here. So uh, that would be, if I go back to my 37, I'm going to add, it. Let's, let's be generous. Let's say 11. We're going to really work with the, with the talker and uh, get, us, get them to be real careful with this mic. So that puts us now at 48 dB. That needs to be an equal sign there. All right, so I, can, I went just by you know, using directivity to my advantage. I went from a 31 dB of potential acoustical gain all the way up to 48 dB of potential acoustical gain, which is pretty good. That's, that's, that's pretty, pretty OK. Um, now, here's, 
here's the catch with calculating acoustical gain. And maybe you kind of thought of this already, is what about the rest of the theater? <laughs> So that's the gain we get for the back row, but what gain would we get in the front row? What gain would we get up in the balcony? Well, it would be different, right? It would be different. Uh, this is all the more reason to design your cluster, center cluster, so that it's distributing evenly to all the seats. That'll help even out this, this gain because the feedback point will be the same. It's just a matter of how much difference are you able to make between direct sound and uh, reinforced sound. So, uh, I think that my rule of thumb with this is I try to think about the worst case scenario. And the worst case scenario is the farthest away from the stage, the farthest away from the talker. That's where you need the most gain because inverse square law is working to your disadvantage because the direct sound is going to be the quietest, the farthest away. Um, so I, I tend to start there if I'm trying to figure this out. Um, uh, and then Lance asked the question, what about like foldback monitors? What if you've got wedges? Um, how does this math change? And the answer is it doesn't really change. It's all, all that really changes is that D0 becomes literally zero because the talker and the listener are the same person. So you would just say, all right, D0 is zero, as in no, there is no distance between the talker and the listener. And then everything else is the same. The microphone distance to the talker to the microphone, last speaker to the microphone, and that's just the last speaker in this case is your monitor wedge. Uh, and then you can figure out your gain. Any questions about that? No? All right, so everybody able to make those fixes to their, their file here? How far off were you? Anybody, was anybody really, really way off? <laughs> uh, I'm within 3dB. <laughs> yeah, I mean. Yeah, I was about it, to say most of it is just. about me too. What was the number for four again? Sorry, just the correct answer. Oh, uh, let's see. I ended up at about 48 dB. Now, again, that's, that's kind of give or take a few dB depending on you know, how you interpreted the polar plot. I definitely got a little mixed up on the microphones. Uh, yeah. First, green was like the polar plot says minus, so let's start subtracting. So, but I realize my mistake. <laughs> yeah. So the whole idea here is you're going to get more gain, right? <laughs> so, uh, so you're back. So that was backwards. That's fine. But uh, so that's an easy fix. Okay, uh, so Lance isn't able to join us in real time, but let's take a minute and I'll take you through what I asked him to do. Uh, which is, and you guys didn't have to do this, but uh, I asked him to calculate the average absorption coefficient of the patron's theater. So let's take a look at, at that. So uh, if I go to the CAD file of the patron's theater, what we're gonna try to do here is figure out the total surface area, okay? So, That's a, wow. so uh, the first thing I want to do is turn off a bunch of stuff that I don't care about. So let me turn off the grid, turn off the air ducts. What? You don't care about the air ducts? Not for this. That's <laughs> uh, surface area. I don't need that. Um, let's see. What else can I turn off here? Where is that stuff? Masking pipes. Oh, there we go. Okay, get rid of that. Let's get rid of this proscenium that isn't, we don't ever use anymore. Um, I don't even really need the seats or the risers or the text. Okay, so, uh, Ooh, I can even get rid of the trap. We don't need that either. So uh, you could get really into the weeds on this and try to figure out all of the different things. But let's just, to simplify this, let's just forget about the doors. Um, forget about the little booth bump out. Um, let's just pretend that that's not part of this because it's not going to make a huge difference. Uh, and let's just figure out total surface area on the walls because the walls are all painted cinder block in that room. 
Have, those of you that have been in there, that that's right, yeah? It's, yeah, it's just Black Sunday Rock. Yeah. So uh, let's figure out how much of that stuff we have. So from this wall to this wall, or this corner, I'm doing 41 feet, okay? And then that wall is how tall? It is 28 feet tall. So 41 times 28. I get 1,148 square feet. Did I do that math right? Seems like it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, seems uh, like it. And I have two of those walls, right? So I'm gonna times that by two. I'll put that in my memory. So now let's look at the side walls. How big are they? Well, from here to there, is 59 feet 8 inches. I'm gonna just call it 60. So 60 times same height, right? 28. I get 1,680 and I have two of those walls too. So times 2, I get 3,360. So I'm gonna add that into my memory. So I have 5,656 square feet. So let's see, 5,656 square feet of painted brick. Okay? Now, what about the floor? Anybody know what the floor is made of? It's like a wood composite situation. Yeah, um, it's you know it's basically masonite on top of plywood. <laughs> uh, so if we go back in here, we could probably just figure this out. So it would be the sixty times the forty-one, right? So that's 2,460 square feet of that stuff. So 2,460 square feet of wood floor. Uh, and then we'd also have 2,460 square feet of whatever the ceiling is made of, which is basically metal. I mean, it's a combination of, well, it's all steel, right? It's, it's, some steel beams and some corrugated steel underneath that's on top of concrete. So, so steel on concrete. Okay, so what do we do with that information? Well, let's find out what the absorption coefficients are for that, those kinds of materials. If I go to the little chart that I shared with you on class, looks like this. Okay, so which of these things seems like it uh, most, most closely describes our walls. Concrete block painted. Yeah, I think so. Um, so you have to ask yourself, what frequency? Because it's different, right? <laughs> um, I, in, in the context of absorption, usually the frequencies you care most about are this you know, 1K to 4K range, because that's where the intelligibility happens. And the, the reflections really kill your intelligibility. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna look in this area here, and I'm just gonna pick whatever the, the smallest number is, which is 0 0.07. Um, so this one is 0 0.07 which is actually not very absorptive, right? It's only absorbing 7% of the energy that hits it. The rest is being reflected, presumably. Okay, what about the floor? Hey, there's a wood floor. Okay, so looking at my 1K to 4K range, the smallest number is 0 0.06. So I'll put that in 0 0.06. Now, what about the steel? 
Uh, I don't really have anything for that, but it's certainly not going to be a whole lot different from the painted concrete, right? It's going to be, if anything, it would be a little bit more reflective than that. Uh, so let's just use that, that same number. Uh, we'll do the 0 0.07 of that. Okay. So now what do I do with that information? Well, uh, I need to figure out how much perfect absorption this represents. So I'm going to take the 5656 five, and times that by 0 0.07, and I get 395.92. So I'll put that in there. Now I'm going to take the 2460 times 0 0.06. I get 147.6. Plug that in. And now 2460 uh, times 0 0.07. I get that. OK, so I have 715 square feet, or the equivalent of 715 square feet of perfect absorption. And I need to compare that against the total surface area of the room. Now, what's the total surface area of the room? It would be 5656 plus 2460 plus 2460. 10,576. Somebody remember that number? 10,576. OK, so I'm going to take this number and divide that by 10,576. That is the average absorption coefficient of my room, 0 0.06, 0 0.07 if you round it. Okay? So we're saying that 0.07% of whatever sound we're putting in the room is going to not come back to us? Yeah? Right. Okay, so, I just want to make sure I'm assigning the number. So that, the that, right. basic, that basically means that 7% of the energy that goes, hits the walls in the room gets absorbed. The rest of it comes back. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, great. So that is the, an the answer for five is probably in that, that area. So now I said, what happens if we pull the curtains over the walls? Well, remember, one of the things that I hid from this CAD file was some curtains. Look at them. And those of you that have been in the patrons, you know that we have these curtain tracks that can be pulled across these three walls, right? Uh, this is why they're there, because a 0 .7, 0 0.07 absorption coefficient is not super awesome for a room where you're trying to understand what people are saying. And, so the question is, how big of a difference does, do the curtains make? Well, let's, let's see if we can figure that out. So going back here, I'm going to take these numbers here, put them down here. So the painted brick is going to get a lot less, right? So we're going to get, um, all but one wall of that is going to turn into something else. And I should have written down the separate values for that. I forgot to do that. Uh, so let's just measure the one wall that we know isn't <laughs> covered, and then we can subtract that from our number. So, 50, so that's 60, and what was our height again? Anybody remember? I'll measure it. Last number I remembered was like 1,000 something, 10,000. 60 and 28. So, all right, 60 times 28, 1680. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract that from whatever this number is, that 5656. 
So minus 1680, 39.76. So, all right. So I now have 39.76 square feet of curtain over painted brick. <laughs> uh, and I, that means I only have 1680 of painted brick. Okay? So what do we think the absorption coefficient of these curtains are gonna be? Well, let's take a look here. So I'm gonna guess it's the heavyweight drapery. And one of the things we've done is if you look at those curtain tracks, we very purposely had the architect build tracks that held those curtains up against the wall, you know, away from the wall. So there's, there's a good foot uh, off of the wall. Um, and it drives the scene designers crazy because they're like, oh, it's taking up space in the room. It's like, yeah, but it works better. Uh, so let's assume, let's just take this drapery, heavyweight drapery for what it is. Let's not worry about what's behind it for now because the fact that it's reflective is gonna help us. That means it's gonna actually uh, absorb twice. Um, so I think we can easily say the 0.7 uh, is gonna be where we are. It might even end up being better than that. But let's just say the 0.7 because that's the number we have. So this will be 0.7, okay? So let's do our math again here. So I have uh, 1680 times 0 0.07 into my memory. I have 3976 times 0.7. And I'm going to put that into my memory. I have 2460 times 0 0.06, put that in my memory, and 2460 times 0 0.07, and put that in my memory. And now I'm going to divide that by the total surface area, which was what? Does anybody remember what that number was? You were going to remember it, Nora. One zero, uh, I failed Five, you. seven, six. Thank you. Okay. I got the first two. So divided by one, zero, what? Five, seven, six. Correct. Five, seven, six. Okay, so now we have an average absorption coefficient of 0.3. Uh, that's more, that's 30%. Yeah, so now 30% of the energy that radiates in this room uh, gets absorbed as opposed to only 7%. That's a pretty big difference, right? It's uh, a huge difference. We still have a lot of energy being reflected. Uh, and so this is where scenery can really help us. We're gonna put people, you know, we're gonna add the seats in, right? So there'll be people there uh, and they will cover up a good chunk of this reflective floor space, uh, right? So if we wanted to keep working on this, we could now add the audience in and say, let's assume we fill the house, which we always do for patrons. So we could cover up that area with people, which are basically perfect absorbers. Uh, and we could add these, cur these curtains into the mix because that's like new surface area that's absorptive that we could add into it. Um, we could even uh, think about, we could start thinking about what the booth might do because that juts out and that covers up a chunk of that wall with something that is a little bit different uh, as far as reflections go. So we could, we could maybe get it down even, even further if we wanted to. Uh, but that's the basic process for figuring this out. Um, uh, and you're not, you know, listen, we're, you're not being trained to be acousticians here, but a lot of times you will be working on projects. Let me stop my share for a minute. So a lot of times you'll be working on projects uh, where people are gonna start saying all kinds of things about acoustics. <laughs> uh, because that's everyone's favorite thing to blame. Oh, the acoustics in here are horrible. But no one actually knows what that means. It's just a word, it's just a, a sentence that people say. Uh, 
and you're gonna and they're you know you're gonna start getting all these ideas kicked around in a production meeting. It's like, oh, we should do this, we should do that, or we should you know, uh, you know, we should cover up the windows or something, or you know, we should put carpet on the floor. And you know, I think your role in that conversation is not to become the acoustician for the show, but it's rather you know to tell them what kind of difference they could, should expect to get from doing that thing, right? So if, for example, it's going to be, it's going to cost them $1,000 uh, in materials and $500 in labor to carpet a piece of the floor on the set. And you could kind of guess, do that quick math in your head and say, how big of a difference is that going to actually make to the absorption coefficient of the room? Not very much. Not very much. I mean, is it likely to be noticeable? Probably no. not, you know? And so, you know, the question would be, well, how, how hard is it going to be to spend that $1,500? Is that a lot of money to us? Uh, what's our budget situation? And they're like, yeah, I mean, we're going to have to dip into reserves to do that. Like, okay, well, maybe that's not the best use of our money, right? <laughs> it's probably not going to make the kind of difference you imagine it's going to make, right? Uh, and they may decide to do it anyway, and then it's fine. You gave them good advice, and then they did what they wanted, right? Uh, so don't let yourself get sucked into being an acoustician, but hopefully you can know enough about acoustics to be able to say, this is likely to help, or this is not likely to help. Um, and if you can at least say that, then that's, that's, that is useful. That is, that is helpful to contribute. All right, any questions about that? that homework so our homework for the coming week is it's in canvas obviously but it's um the the surface area situation no no that was i uh, that was what lance had to do i'm just showing you that because gotcha. lance isn't here and he needs to see how to fix it um so uh yeah you don't have anything for the weekend other than uh i did post on canvas let me show this to you actually um Uh, we're not there yet, but we're going to be there soon. Uh, we're going to do, next week, we're going to do the precedence imaging thing. So on Monday, I'm going to teach you how to calculate precedence imaging, and then you're going to work that week on an assignment that on Friday we'll review. But then the following week, I'm going to start teaching you ease. So something you might want to start working on over the weekend is getting ease installed on your computer. Before Now, I've posted in the module section a download link here for the Ease installation files. Uh, there is a password to it, which is there on the site. Um, and uh, I, you should download those files. Please don't share those files with others because that contains um, our specific license installation. Okay, uh, And we already have a hard enough time with keep, keeping track of those licenses and keeping them from getting lost in the cloud as they're pushing them back and forth. So uh, there's a PDF in there and some installation files about how to do that. Before you can install Ease, you need to uh, have Windows running on your computer in some way, shape, or form. That could be a Parallels desktop type situation, uh, or you could do Boot Camp. Uh, the advantage of Boot Camp is it, that doesn't cost you anything. Uh, I'm pretty sure you can get the Windows installation for free through the University on the Hub site. Uh, and, the par and the Boot Camp is part of your Mac, so that's free. The downside to Boot Camp is that you have to partition your hard drive to do that, um, which means you sort of take a big chunk out of your available storage space in your drive. So Boot Camp tends to take a bigger hit on your hard drive than Parallels does. The other disadvantage to Boot Camp is you have to reboot your Mac into Windows mode, which means when you're running Windows, you don't get to use any of your Mac software. Uh, so Parallels, you have to pay a little bit of money for. It's not a ton, but you know, depending on your financial situation, it might be a ton. So that's a downside. Uh, there is a, you know, there's a discount, certainly an educational discount. Uh, the advantage to Parallels is it uses a disk image rather than a partition. So it's a file that you put on your Mac, 
which means you don't have to reboot your computer. You can just run Windows like it's a program on your Mac. You can still use all your Mac applications at the same time. It also doesn't use as much space on your hard drive. So you can do either solution. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but I would start working on that now so that if you need help, I can help you uh, sure. before you have to start running ease on your computer in a couple of weeks. Any questions about that? I just want to say that the download for that is currently locked. That module is locked until April 3rd. Um, OK, let me fix that. OK, it is now unlocked. However, uh, don't start working on the assignment yet. <laughs> Because uh, you need to work, focus on the precedence, the one. Uh, so start working on that. And if you need help, just let me know. But don't let me know the night before the first ease class. Because uh, our options will be severely limited at that point if you haven't got this figured out by then. So try to, try to work on this now. The, uh, the president, president's imaging one is also well, you're gonna. You said you were gonna start with that in, in next class. Never mind. Yeah, no. yeah. We're talking about that next class. Yeah. I'm just. I'm keeping them locked because I don't want you guys working ahead <laughs> until I've taught you how to do it. Um, so, so th that that'll unlock Monday morning. Uh, so, yeah. Start. So, if spend a little bit of time this weekend starting to figure out how to get Windows running on your computer. Um, and if you run into problems, please let me know sooner than later so we can try to figure out a solution because you're going to need to have Windows running on your computer. Any other questions? I think I'm good. OK. Yeah, I think I'm good. Then we are done. So turn in that re revised uh, homework, and I will look at it. And I'll see you guys hey. on Monday morning. Thanks so much, Jason. All right. All see right. you later. Thanks, Jason. Jason.